most of you know the story in Genesis about the serpent. Was the serpent a literal snake? I'm going to show you why I don't believe so. That's the topic of this video. If one reads the Genesis account, we know that God created the heavens and the earth, and later on we learn about the woman, the man, and the serpent, the two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. And we learn about a conversation that the woman had with the serpent. I'm going to show you some things that are noteworthy. Number one, the woman was not called Eve until after uh, she had uh, disobeyed God and ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad that the serpent had, had gave her. In fact, you're going to see in this video where it was her husband Adam who gave her her name afterwards. Now with regards to the serpent, was the serpent a literal snake. I'm going to show you why I don't believe so. So let's go to the Genesis account in Genesis chapter 3 and let's begin at verse 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any kind of wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must eat from any tree in the garden? Now it is interesting that in this Genesis account, we are not told that the woman saw with her literal eyes a serpent. Everything is about hearing. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And I just mentioned there are only two trees that God placed in the middle of the garden, the tree of life in the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. And those were not literal trees as we know of trees today with leaves on them, right? Tree trunks and all that. These were not literal trees. And continuing at verse two, and you must not touch it or you will die. So God never commanded the man that he could not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and bad or good and evil. But yet here, the woman adds that. Let's reread that. She says to the serpent, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of a garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. That is not what God said to the man. When God gave that command concerning that tree, the woman had not been taken from the man's rib yet. So the command not to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad was given to the man. It was his responsibility as the head of his woman to pass on what God told him to her so that she would know. And obviously she knew because she repeats it to the serpent. And of course she adds a little bit of her own to it with regards to touching the tree. Verse four, the serpent says to the woman, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So here we see the serpent lying on God, saying to the woman essentially that God's lying to you. I'm telling you the truth. You will not die. Of course, you know the consequence of them eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. They eventually grew old, got sick, and died. So God was not lying. It was the serpent who was lying. But again, let's keep to the theme of this video was that serpent a literal snake? Something that the woman saw. Nothing in this account shows where she saw a literal snake. That she saw something. She heard something. And all this really leads me to believe that way back then when God created the man, the man was perfect in every way. He didn't have any sin in him. And for a very long time, the man was alone. Who could he speak to? There was no other human being other than himself until the woman came along. But before she came along, there was no need for him to speak unless he was speaking to himself. So I believe that long ago that 
the man was able to communicate not only with God in what we call telepathy today, but also when his wife was taken from him and when he communicated with her, it was also not with a verbal speech. It was telepathic communication that they had. And it appears that the communication that the woman was having with that serpent was also telepathic. Let's continue with verse six. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They did that. When they ate their fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, it was only at that time that they realized that they were naked. Naked in what sense? I believe that when God created the man, he didn't have this kind of flesh on him. I believe that he was of another substance. It is written that God created man a little lower than the angels. A little lower than the angels. Angels don't have flesh and blood. Angels are spirits. Angels are invisible beings. You can't see an angel. That's not their natural form. Of course, we see today in modern times in art, film, and literature, individuals, religious organizations, and groups always try to uh, condition the masses into believing that angels are uh, typically white babies or white persons with wings. That's all a lie. We cannot see angels. They are not of the earth. They're of the spiritual heavenly realm. So what's the serpent, a literal snake? Let's continue at verse eight. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God when he was walking in the garden. Notice here again, they didn't see the Lord God, they heard the Lord God. It's like the woman when she was having conversation with that serpent. She didn't see a serpent, she heard something. So again, at verse eight, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you. You see that? I heard you. I didn't see you, but I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. At verse 11, God says to the man, Who told you you were naked? In other words, I didn't tell you you were naked. I created you this way. So why all of a sudden now you realize that you are naked? Then God says to the man, have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? Uh, notice at verse 13 that the man is gonna blame all this on the woman and God. He's taking no responsibility for what he did. Verse 13, he says, the woman you put here with me. You see here, he's pointing a finger at God. You gave me her. She gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. So he put the blame on God and the woman. Verse 13, then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Verse 14, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. So now let's think about this now. Prior to this curse that got placed upon the serpent, if it was a literal snake, apparently it was something that was not crawling on its belly prior to God placing this curse upon the serpent. It's only when God places a curse upon the serpent that we see it crawling on its belly. Then God goes on to say to the serpent, and you must eat dust 
all the days of your life. Snakes don't literally eat dust, do they? I believe that this crawling on its belly is allegorical, not a literal crawling on its belly, like it is not a literal snake. And I'm gonna show you that in a few moments. At verse 15, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Uh oh, but the serpent will have offspring also? What other snakes crawling around? That's not what this means. This has a much deeper prophetic meaning. So again, at verse 15, pay attention. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, that is the serpent's offspring, and hers. I'll create another video showing that enmity in the book of Revelation. It's right there. Many miss it. And the woman's offspring is allegorically a he, because we're told here, he will crush your head, that is a serpent's head, and you will strike his heel. This is mentioned also in Revelation. Verse 16, and to the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now it is true that women, when they bear children, have birth pains. This is also mentioned in the book of Revelation. Jesus spoke of these birth pains in Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse six and eight. And then God turns to the man. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Now let's stop right here. To Adam, God said, because you listened to your wife. The act of eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad was listening. So the fruit on that tree was not a literal fruit. Just look at the title of the tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and bad. So what is that fruit? It is the knowledge of good and bad. That's the fruit, not an apple like we see in depicted in art, film, and literature. That is the fruit. The act of eating was listening. Like right now, I'm speaking. I'm speaking the fruit of lips. Those who are hearing my words, they are receiving it. Thus, they're eating what I'm dispensing. So again, at verse 17, to Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Let me stop here. Many men today, before their creator, are making the same mistake that Adam made. They're listening to these women rather than listening to God. They give their inherent headship to women. And they allow women to counsel them, to direct them. I respect women. I have a mother. I have sisters. But I also have a God. My God, and, I, and many women don't get this, but within me, I have an issue with women preaching to me about what God has already told me. It is my responsibility as a man to take the lead to ensure that any woman in my life, and especially a wife, if she chooses to be my wife, that she's with me in my household, because in my household, I'm going to worship God. So either she's with me or she's not. If she's not going to be with me, then obviously she's not going to be my wife. But she has to Roll with me on this. She cannot be headstrong and be like Eve. But many men, they allow women to become their heads. The Apostle Paul wrote at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, that the head of the woman is man. The head of man is Christ. And the head of Christ is God. Prior to Adam eating the fruit that the woman gave him, that's that knowledge of good and bad that the serpent 
gave her, he did not have to worry about anything. He could not even keep the one command not to eat the fruit from that one tree. All the trees in the garden that were provided for him and his woman for food, he could not even keep that. His woman beguiled him in a sense to eat, to disobey God. This is the mistake many men today are making. They're allowing these women to get them to disobey God. So if you're in some church setting, for example, and there's a woman up there in that pulpit preaching to you, what are you doing? Why are you okay with that? Why are you allowing that? I know we live in a modern age here in the United States and it's politically correct for those things to uh, be done. But those are the rules of men, not of God. You're allowing these women to not only disrespect you, but to disrespect the creator. And who do you think is behind that? The very same entity that deceived the woman. He is the one behind the deception today where we have all these women who believe that they are to be, that they can be preachers and pastors and teachers of men. No. Did Jesus choose any women to be one of his apostles? No. He chose 12 men. And this will agitate a lot of women. But you see, if you are a strong man, you're going to stand your ground on account of your creator. You're going to be more in fear of your creator than you are of any human being and especially any woman. And a lot of these women today are headstrong. Look at them, especially here in the United States, especially in the West. Many of them are very masculine in their mannerisms because they want to compete with men. Even in the sporting arena, these women want to fight men. They want to box men, compete with them in each and every sporting event. In my view, women should be competing against women, men against men. Men are physically stronger. Yes, there are exceptions where there are some women who are physically stronger than men and some men are just are weak physically. But in general, and everyone knows that, men are more muscular and stronger. So prior to the man disobeying God, he didn't have nothing to worry about, not even feeding himself. God provided fully for him. God did not forbid the man from eating the fruit from the tree of life. He could fully partake in that. But the serpent had directed attention to the one tree that God had forbade the man to eat from. Verse 19, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will remain. Now at verse 20, we see here where Adam gives his wife a name. Prior to all this, she didn't have a name. She was just his woman, his wife. Verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Now let's talk about this serpent. I do not believe that this serpent in the garden was a literal snake. We don't even read the expression Satan and devil in Genesis account because Satan and devil did not exist in this sense. This serpent later on became Satan and devil. So let's identify what this serpent was in the garden. I'm going to turn your attention to Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 11. And we'll read down to verse 19. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Now the son of man here isn't referring to Jesus Christ. This is referring to us. We are sons of man. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the seal of perfection. This is referring to the serpent, the one that became Satan and devil. In the garden, this serpent was not that. This serpent was not a literal snake. You're going to see this in a few moments. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. At verse 13, we see where this serpent was. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So this serpent 
was in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, chrysolite, emerald, topaz, onyx, jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created, they were prepared. God created this serpent. And again, this serpent was not a literal snake. Today, the one that the world knows as Satan and devil, and many include in there the serpent, two different things. We're seeing a serpent, a beautiful, perfect creature, being that later on became Satan and devil, whose beauty is compared to precious stones. Not this hideous creature that we see depicted in art, film, and literature with horns and a pitchfork, red in appearance, hideous in appearance. And we're told here that this serpent was created. Verse 14, this here tells us exactly what that serpent was. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. So the serpent in the Garden of Eden was not a literal snake. It was something much different. It was an anointed, not just a cherub, an anointed cherub. What is a cherub? A cherub is an angel of high rank. Angels are not flesh and blood. Angels are invisible. That is why the woman did not see a snake. She heard something speaking to her because I believe that Adam and this and the woman themselves communicated telepathically. They didn't have the language that we have today where we use this to speak. The communication was telepathic. Adam could even communicate with the animals telepathically. I believe this. So, again, at verse 14, you were anointed as a guardian cherub. A guardian cherub. So what was this cherub guarding? God's creation. The man and the woman. He was placed in the garden to take care of them. That was his responsibility. And we're told here, for so I ordained you. God ordained this serpent. And we're told here also, you were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. The fiery stones are the other angelic hosts. The brothers of this anointed cherub, the other angels. And again, a cherub is an angel of high ranking. Verse 15, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. For the second time we see here that this anointed cherub, this anointed guardian cherub was created. And he was blameless in his ways. God loved this anointed cherub, else he would not have anointed him and placed him in the garden to take care of his precious creation, the man and his woman, and ultimately us who will be their offspring. And we're told here at verse 15, until wickedness was found in you. So what was this wickedness that was found in this anointed cherub? Well, when he called God a liar and told the woman that she would not die if she ate the fruit from the tree of a knowledge of good and bad. That was wicked because that was a lie. He slandered God's name, he lied, on his own creator. Verse 16, through your widespread trade, you are filled with violence and you sinned. So this anointed cherub sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. So again, we're told how beautiful this anointed cherub, this serpent was on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom. So this anointed cherub was wise and is still wise to this very day. It's just his wisdom now, it is corrupted because of your splendor. 
So I threw you to the earth and made you a spectacle before kings. So by your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you. What we're being told here is that the serpent that became Satan and devil is toast. His days are numbered. He's already been judged for destruction. And this is also in the book of Revelation. So I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who are watching. This is key in understanding. The serpent later on became Satan and devil. He has already been judged for destruction. His days are numbered and he knows that. That's why we see the expression fire used here because when something is burned with fire, it ceases to exist. If one takes a piece of paper, for example, and you throw it into a fire, it ceases to become a paper. It's ashes on the ground. So it's in this sense that the serpent is crawling on its belly. Its days are numbered. This is not a literal snake. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. That's what it says here. You will be no more. The serpent later on became signal double. Days are numbered. One day he will be no more. So the serpent in the garden was not a literal snake. It was an anointed guardian cherub, an angel of high rank. Angels are invisible. That's why we never read anywhere in the Genesis account where Adam or his wife saw anything. She heard, she didn't see, she heard something speaking to her. An anointed guardian cherub speaking to her. Many get tripped up in this expression serpent because it is a more modern term and people today and rightly so, because of modern terminology, associate a serpent with snakes. This is a different type of serpent. Angels are created free moral agents. They can choose to obey God or they can choose to disobey him. God doesn't create robots. We ourselves were created a little lower than angels. We can choose to obey God and we can also choose to disobey him. That was the case with Adam. Adam chose to listen to his wife, thus disobeying God. He made that decision. So the serpent was not a literal snake. The serpent was an anointed guardian cherub. This is R. Jerome Harris, the disciple. Thank you for listening.